instruments for sheep. In the evening she would come to the top of her cocoon and she would sing to the moon. She lived in here by herself. Um, and this is what her song sounded like. I grew up on a farm with my mum and dad, Lawrence, Gerald Kavanagh, and my mum, Chris Lavinia Cashel. And basically I grew up with three siblings. Yeah, just like in a rural setting on a farm. Did you see the koai when we came down? It's huge, just like a crane. Yeah. And then there's another little cave right next to it. Yeah. Yeah, they nest up there. 
wasn't really the classic farming Sami, but I loved being in the nature and being in the, you know, in the bush, in the ngaidi, climbing trees, listening to the manu, and trying to sort of mimic the tui and the kurimako. Not so much whistling or with any type of puro, but just my voice. When I was 16, we went for a holiday up in, in Tūranga in Gisborne, and my auntie came outside one lunch and was like, hey, look at these. I just sort of knew what to do with it. Yeah, I knew how to hold it up to my mouth and like, I was sort of one of those tamariki that pick it up and then boom, like a sound in it. And I remember the feeling of the wood, the totara vibrating on my hand and that's actually what made me feel like, whoa, and of course the sound. I went to Australia, couldn't handle the jandal, came back depressed and suicidal, and then our whanaunga came along and helped me, took me into the bush. Then I came back out and just started making kōwewe. What sort of brought me out was this, you know, this idea of being able to create these beautiful taonga that I was so attracted to. And that time when I was learning to make them and play them, though that was healing me. The puro healed me. After that, I just became obsessed with puro. My main source of inspiration to take on this mahi is a hidden Melbourne. He was the first person I heard playing puro creating these beautiful waiata around our putaio and our atua and linking them to the puros. I could actually feel the aroha that he had for his dead kaupapa. He's the tupuna who's inspired me to, to try and follow that pathway. I collaborate with my partner Taryn and we have done pretty much since we first came together. Going back to our belief and guidance from our tūpuna, I feel like our partnership and relationship was formed through that. We're looking at, okay, here's my mokopuna down here. She's doing beautiful tāmoko and, oh, we've got a mokopuna over here. He's doing pūro, let's put that back together. and. Yeah, and a lot of it's about reviving practices, those beautiful practices our tupuna had. Puro helps off the pain. And so naturally, you play puro when someone's receiving their tamako, because this is sort of pain, a bit of pain happening there, both physically and emotionally. It's really important that I present the puro to the tamariki as much as possible. Here you go. Put your hands in over where my hands are. That's it. The next generation, they can pick it up and, you know, that spirit of sharing, our tonga continues. Right now is the time, not a good time as far as the earth, Papa Tuanuku, being able to sustain us parasitic humans. If you look at solution, you don't need to look far as far as like 
the indigenous voice. Often referred to as Tonga Puru is Voices of the Elements. You provide the ha and then the oro, the puru, you know that sets off the oro, the vibration, singing out to the people. Reminds them you're connected to the tree. Or if you hear that. Ponamu one, and you love that, remember you're connected to the Ponamu. The indigenous voice needs to be recognised and heard and it needs to be loud and clear for everyone. Ooh. Mm -hmm.